All right. Welcome back, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Today, our special guest is Zachary Taylor. He is from the great quilt capital of the world, Paducah, <laughs> Kentucky. And he came to this great city of angels some 12 odd years ago, pursuing theater. We'll catch up and, and see what uh, that mission has, has been like. But first, I want to start it off with chess. Because chess. he saw Armando and I and my cousin Jonathan playing mm. chess recently, and he wanted to hop in. So I'm going to start with the anecdote, and then we're going to jump into to Zach's views on chess. So I was playing Zachary maybe about 10 years ago one time, and this is a time where I knew he was an inception specialist because very, very softly under his breath, and I know this from hindsight bias, he was going, and without knowing it, I began singing Three Blind Mice. And I didn't even know why I was singing Three Blind Mice, but it was because almost like a decibel of a, of a dog whistle. He was humming it so low, like I wasn't even conscious. And my subconscious made me start singing Three Blind Mice. First of all, do you remember that? Second of all, what are your thoughts on chess? <laughs> um, I, I don't remember that. Um, <laughs> my, my, my thoughts on Inception during chess is it's very useful. You have to get inside your opponent's mind. Uh, so very successful in that sense. Um, I, I love chess. I love. I haven't played in so long. So when I saw you guys playing, I was like, "Yeah, I want to. I want to get out on that." How, but, how did you learn? I want to get back to that psyops, to that dude, psychology, playing, because like I friends. agree. Yeah, yeah, just playing with friends. That's how I learned. And then, like, I tried to read books on it. I didn't uh -huh. have the patience for it. I didn't have it. <laughs> Anyway. I have a boy who does that. He he reads like strategies. I've never read any strategies. I, like you, I learned I learned through practice. My yeah. dad taught me at like some specific point when I was a kid, and I had like little chess sets. And even my first computer was like a Windows ninety five that had word processing, jazz ball, and chess. So those are like nice. the things those are like we had. life covered. <laughs> those are the things I know how to yeah. do. I know how to type. Yeah. Not the fastest, but I'm kind of accurate. I know how to play yeah. jazz ball. If anyone remembers what that game is, mm -hmm. uh, it's like where you have the the lines and you try to box in the the red and white balls as they're going back and forth yeah, on the screen. It's kind of a two D. Okay, okay, yeah. you know that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that and chess. Yeah, I got to go. So going to that psyop portion, I've had different experiences playing chess on an app. Like for example, That's my friend Rustin and I. Yeah, I was in North Dakota. He was in L.A. I had another friend, again, maybe I think when I was in uh, Merced in Central California, mm -hmm. and this friend was in L.A., and we'd play on the app, and I felt like I couldn't really talk shit. Like, there's a chat, but you could easily ignore the chat, mm -hmm. um, but there's something, like, when you're face-to-face, -face, you have all the nonverbal cues. I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, do you, do you say anything to people when you play chess? <laughs> when, when I'm playing them, yeah, I, I enjoy talking to them, I like, you know, chatting as much as I can. Not to distract them just because it's like you're there with someone for like a long period of time. That's such an abnormal thing to do. So it's like <laughs> I hate to I hate to like not like talk to the person play, like you're playing chess with and yeah. befriend them and then like lose to them. But like it's just kind of that socialization. But when you're playing on the online and stuff, it's so mathematical. The people yeah. who do the best are the ones who will do study and are like so. But that's really smart because you do learn how to play chess better that way. It is. It's almost like I wish I did it like with video games. Like if I'm mm -hmm. playing someone chess online, I need to have a headset and I need to be able to, they need to be able to hear my voice. You know, they need to be a captive audience to my yeah. voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was definitely some uh, parts of the Armando's uh, interview that I watched that uh, I got thrown back to the old days <laughs> where, where you guys would just question each other back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's hilarious about that is like, what? so I don't know if you've seen the, the rest of my channel. I do a lot of things like monologue. You know what I mean? You could appreciate yeah. that as a, as a thespian. Like I do a lot of things on my own. So when I bring guests on, my goal, my vision is to like highlight the guest and get the guest to talk. And I'm almost like a fly on the wall documentarian. Uh, totally. But Armando kept repeatedly asking me questions and like that's open ended I saw, questions. That's what I noticed. Yeah, yeah. He was straight up at least like diverting. He's like, I don't ask me that question. Here's a better question for you. <laughs> yeah, and, and some of the greatest moments is when I would get him to talk on like how he's a gold salesman or on how he knows about this early vaudeville, like pre-vaudeville magician named Alexander the Man Who Knows. And he knows like all these specific <laughs> Yeah, it was so awesome. 
I was like, oh, that's an expertise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, he's a he's a member in good standing at Hollywood's Magic Castle. Whenever you want to go in, that's crazy. All Seriously, he'll get you in there. I kind of hate magicians at the same time as I I have uh, relationships with magicians. You know, um, tell me about my old roommates. Uh, my old roommates from uh, college was a magician as well. But I just hate when people have and know. Sanguk was a magician. No, no, Sanguk was not. He oh. uh, went back into the army for a little bit, and then I, I have no idea what he's doing now. Um, no, no, John Hayes. I don't know if you met John. He was a uh, fellow I don't, I don't remember him. I, uh, maybe if I saw him. Yeah, I'm a real man with uh, good with his hands. It makes a card disappear, you know? Um, <laughs> That's scary. Yeah, right? <laughs> I just hate when people do a trick and, and show you how clever they are, but they won't tell you how it's done. Oh, okay, you, you like, like to hear the reveal? Done. Yeah, well, like, I mean, I know how it's done. Just tell me if I'm right. Uh -huh. And it's like, why would you keep that as a secret? If magic's yeah. so cool and so precious. Right. I, I I liked giving people the kind of option of give me three guesses. If I get it within three, you have to tell me. If not, then yeah. okay. But I I get to like it's almost like a like a secret society or something, you know, mm -hmm. like a like a fraternity. It yeah. it's interesting. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't ever join a fraternity, right? No. Right. So that's a that's like an interesting thing, I think. There was some weird universal confluence about our dorm. You know, one of the things Armando and I discussed about our freshman year dorm, it did not have a rich donor's name attached to it. It did not have a spiritual life advisor. Every yeah. other dorm did. And that's yeah, weird. Absolutely. Well, we and were we all like the kind of more like athletes and everything like that. So they had a looser world around them. Yeah, like, we had the older, older people. Were there. Yeah, and older people. Older athletes yeah. too. Like, yeah. Jake, I think, was like a fifth-year senior. <laughs> we <were> like, yeah. <laughs> Konkin, Konkin had uh, served like five years or something or some significant time in the Korean army and then came back. Yeah. It, it, was a, it was a very weird mix of people. Well, who was the French dude who was in the... Jeremy? Jeremy, yeah. And Pierre? No, Pierre, I think, was in a different one. Jeremy actually moved into our dorm, I think. Or it was Pierre. One of them did. No, 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 no. Jeremy was there originally because he had... He had the great Chris Simpson, if you remember that character. No. That was the guy down it. to drive across country and uh, uh, do a lot of different uh, aspects. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't have. There were a few of those people who got kicked yeah. out of that dorm. So that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's part of probably why you don't uh, recall that. But yeah, go, going back to it was, it's interesting what you mentioned the. I think you didn't use the term, but the, the intimacy yeah. of chess. So you're saying like, totally. if you're just sitting there and you don't strike a conversation, is it is it awkward because of how intimate the, the situation it's, is? Or it's not what awkward. I just, enjoy, I just enjoy talking to the person. And I also enjoy the idea. I know it's like psychological for me, but I enjoy the idea of um, engaging with their mind and distract, like, almost distracting them, but also like kind of figuring out what they're playing at and what that kind of person they are. So it's like kind of a read uh, yes. situation, even though it's not like really, and I'm not really able to do it. I feel like I am. And I feel like that's important to my game. Do you ever watch Hunter x Hunter, the anime or ever read the manga? No. Okay. This is a spoiler alert. I hope you don't mind. There's a character named King who's a villain and mm -hmm. uh, they play Go, which is like, you know, the, I think Japanese version of chess. Oh, it's just, it's just a strategy game if it's not one for one. And anyway, the way he describes it is that he finds people's rhythm and then his goal is to disrupt their rhythm. And it yeah. sounded exactly like what you're saying. Like you yeah. read the the vibe or the rhythm, whatever their flow is. And then mm -hmm. you're like, you know, throwing a big rock in the stream. So to, <laughs> you're yeah. damming up yeah. their flow. <laughs> Splash it up. Because if you can do that to them, then it, the game is just even killed. Neither one of you know what's going on. <laughs> At least I don't. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's I, going on. I, I liked that. I'm, I'm going to throw another uh, reminisce on you, a little memory, and we'll see if uh, we're linking up here on this memory. Mm. I remember that you're a runner amongst many of your talents, oh, yeah. and I, I was not quite a runner. And this was the time where I began uh, looking down on the ultra marathoning and longer distance, and I developed that thought later on and yeah. was more interested in sprinting. But the thing that I was open to was running an occasional mile or two with you. 
And yeah. I remember sometimes we would go out at midnight or 2 a.m. on the track and we'd go and just run like a mile or two miles. I don't know how often we did it, like once a week or every other week, but I remember that was something that I liked to disrupt my normal, like I was I was into powerlifting at the time. So yeah. that used to like disrupt my powerlifting flow is to go run with you and just have like midnight conversations. So I don't know if you if you recall that and what sort of, uh, you know, running or 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 kind of strength training or whatever whatever you do for fitness if anything yeah. at all you know in quarantine <laughs> or even before uh finishing quarantine has been a really interesting thing since the gyms and everything been closed but i feel like running is such a good distractor from do doing any kind of lift weighting weight lifting or anything like that just because it changes the rhythm and you really need to like kind of put a lot of cardio to kind of like slow everything down but yeah, man, I do. I do run still. I run like three or four miles if I'm gonna go. That's legit. Yeah. It's are you nice. just like guesstimating it, or you you have something that you're tracking yourself with, I'll like track some step it counter? One. Yeah, I'll, I'll do step counter. I'll do or um, I'll do Nike Run Club, and I'll start it like you know just to get the the route tracked down, and then I'll just from then on I'll just do it without it. So you man, you're still in L.A. I gotta ask, yeah, do you run into any side. characters on the east side? Nice. Do you yeah. run into any characters when you're doing these outside runs? Because you're not like on a track. You're out. You're just outdoors. Yeah. No, I love I love running through the city. Yeah. I've, um, I don't know about characters, but I've got like this kind of homeless person that I, I'll, I'll, some, I used to kind of sat, like, stop and chat with uh -huh. um, that was like on the route. And she was really nice. And we, we kind of got uh, chatting once. And then every now and then I'll just like have that person I say hi to. But other than that, it's just like, um, yeah. What do you mean, like characters and like people we used to know? No, I mean, yeah, I mean that would be really crazy. But but yeah, yeah, I just I think that you know it's like such a thing that's in movies, right? Yeah, which is I like mean, a, I live in know, the same great... neighborhood I have for six years. Yeah, like, I've lived over in Atwater Village, which is on the east side, over north of Silver Lake and all that jazz, uh -huh. you know, like Frogtown and all that. Yeah. And then, um, so yeah, I bump into people on runs, but I usually try to stay away from, especially during COVID, just try to stay away from oh, all, like the busier places. Of course. Like I don't run on the main streets or anything, but I'll bump into people who are like, who live in the same neighborhood or just, you know, get a honk every now and then. That's what I was going to say is like, you know, in, in Tarantino's films, like one of the things that come to mind, I'm forgetting the name now. I think it's like the Crazy Eight or whatever the, yeah. the Western kind of shootout was recently. Mm -hmm. Was that Crazy Eight? Yeah, it's Crazy Eight. Like the door itself became a character and I'm not calling you a door, but like when you're running <laughs> in a yeah. neighborhood that you've been in for six years, it's almost like you become a figure, you know, you're like a, a local, you're a character yeah. or a, like you have a, a role in the story of, of Atwater village or the, the greater hipster area there, yeah, that, yeah, that greater totally. echo park, silver Lake, all, all the uh, great places that it's great dining out there. I love going to out to that part of town actually. And uh, it's always changing. Like it's, yeah, no, <laughs> it's it always, is, yeah. it's always updating. That's actually, I think, one of the most creative places. Like I think it 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 draws creatives. So I'm not surprised that that it 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 drew you. So that that, that I think is a, a good segue. So I've seen you post some like music and stuff that you do, yeah. right? You're just playing yeah, around. Yeah. Did you ever s switch your goals, or do you have like multiple? hollywood goals like is it is the music something you've been pursuing or are you still in like hollywood in terms of like acting yeah i think the music's uh something i'm pushing more for right now um mm -hmm. and in fact i think it's been that way for probably the best uh pro probably experienced music the same way you experienced uh, a mark mm -hmm. the way you, you talked about in um another one of your videos you said about 10 years ago right yeah I think I had the same thing where I got done with school and I thought I was interested in do, pursuing acting and like kind of theater, but I didn't know how to, yeah. I didn't know how to approach it. And I didn't know how to do the things that I was interested in doing, um, which was a little bit more, uh, I didn't know at that time, you know what I mean? I didn't know how to feel like I wanted to explore more pieces of being an artist and pieces of being uh, creative other than just like what I, I could perceive to be the existence of, Right, we get through school. You're going to auditions, and then you're doing like workshops, and you're maybe interns turning somewhere, and then you're gonna like. And I didn't understand any of that, and how mm -hmm. it was actually benefit beneficial. Um, but I kind of started playing music at the same time, and started kind of so I could keep being creative and keep being expressive. 
And um, I kept doing that for the last 10 years, and I feel like I've, um, I'm becoming fluent in something that I actually, at this point, want to pursue as like a, a career. That's thing. cool, man. That's, that's what I like to see is I, um, you know, my initial interest was always politics. And yeah. um, after working in Congress, I got really disgusted with electoral politics. So what, what I kind of focused on- How long did you work in Congress? Oh, very briefly. I'm talking yeah. about a four or five month internship for Dennis okay. Kucinich. Do you remember him? He ran for president in 08. He's a Democratic congressman from Ohio. Okay. Um, really awesome guy. I was one week too young to vote in 08. But had I voted in the primaries, I would have selected him. Ultimately, I liked Obama at the time. I don't know if you remember this. I was bumping uh, Nas's black president at the time when we had a very <laughs> silent campus at Pepperdine yeah. Conservative <laughs> University. <laughs> Um, I, you know, and he later disappointed me, but I for sure was, was liking him in that moment, even though I had preferred, uh, Dennis and I, and I later got to work for Dennis, uh, like three years later after that. But, um, even that short, short, short instance of, uh, being yeah. there in, in a intimate office of like seven people, I got to see a lot of the, the goings on. And, you know, some people compare it to like, when you see how sausage is made in a sausage machine you no yeah. longer maybe want to eat that and yeah. you know other people have become vegans and vegetarians the way that they've seen the process in which you know factory farming uh, is uh been going on in the united states other people see it and still keep going but um wh why i mention that is i i see a lot of structures that i believe hold people back from w being self-employed I think there are a lot of actual like laws and things in place that are preventing people in an artificial way. And I think the more like natural organic way of living is that. So the fact that you're finding your your voice in music and being able to do that and you know being able to begin to materialize that is like what I'm trying to do in in this platform. I've had, you know, conversational skills for a while but never really had the the kind of courage to keep acting on it so in, in various ways i've been writing for years but i hadn't been making videos as often it's like sporadic so the fact that you're you're doing that is cool have you have you found mm -hmm. a voice in the sense of you know you know what genre you want to do or have you begun releasing on on other platforms like i've seen you on instagram i don't know if you're on soundcloud or, or something yeah. like that um yeah i started uh releasing stuff on soundcloud like a. Uh... Uh, about a year ago and I, that's a bunch of like really beginning of the production kind of figuring out how it all works but it's all kind of uh, meditative lo-fi electronic music um, and then I've just bought, like, released some stuff on Spotify with a friend of mine who's more of like a, um, re like retro I'd say indie it's indie rock most at this, you know but it's not like this it's not like a band indie rock it's more of electronic mm -hmm indie rock kind of situation that's an interesting um, mix I, I, yeah. I don't know if you know i went i went to the like hard haunted and stuff years ago so i've been a fan you know of uh bloody beat roots steve aoki the, theirs is definitely not oh, lo-fi yeah that's not lo-fi yeah, it's well, more intense it electronic but the first one because like, i really didn't know what i was doing i was recording everything so low that even when i brought everything up to like regular levels as much as i understood it yeah it was still kind of uh, almost like digitally distorted and the fact that it just felt like it was a uh, I didn't understand how to make frequencies stand out. So it was like, everything was just kind of this, uh, it was more like a, uh, not Picasso, but like, you know, like a smear, like a smeared canvas. It's just like a yeah. bunch of smeared colors. So instead of it being like, that's a stark color, that's a stark color. And there are, there are all these instruments you see that's like more just like palette of texture. So you're, you're playing with the sound engineering too. You're not just like buying recording equipment yeah. and recording, like you're engineering yeah. yourself. You're not sending, yeah. you're not outsourcing that at all. Um, I haven't been for the, the projects I've been doing, and I've I've been working with another producer to do the stuff I've released on SoundCloud. Where he, I'm, I'm sometimes recording stuff on doing the engineering on my own, and sometimes we're doing it together. It just depends on the song, or whatever the project. But on this last one, I've had like I had three or four of the songs that I I wrote completely from scratch, and then he redid the drums on them so that they were like more of like the tonally all together. So it was really cool experience. I learned a lot by doing it. You know what I mean? Because every single one of these things, I've learned so much, and it's not really about like, yeah, but no, that's it's, how, yeah, yeah, that that's so cool that like, 
because there's there's this balance right like yeah you can't do absolutely everything but everything that you give to somebody else you begin to be subject to them i think i kind of sensed that when you said like being in a in a band did you did you have band yeah. experience before or i i played with like a couple guys like uh like kind of jamming out and stuff but i never really played in a band so like I, even the stuff I'm creating that sounds like a band, it's more like you're trying to take textures that you recognize and remember familiar and bring them in because you like that combination that you've heard el elsewhere, you know? So I like live instrument sounds and I like the way that people live add uh, effects to their stuff. Um, either like, you know, you're talking about electric guitar or something like that. But yeah. um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, be pigeonholed to playing just that one instrument you know I, i'm i'm writing uh, i'm writing i'm composing you know so i just kind of go and i just kind of pick textures that i want to along the way or whichever is at hand that's good that's good so you yeah. can you can play to multiple audiences I've, I've always respected musicians who were able to do that well some people don't make that transition so well i remember when little wayne tried yeah. to transition to rock uh, i don't know if you ever saw that but no <laughs> it was a it was a rough one um kid yeah. cuddy played with moving genres around eminem too i think more recently has gotten well, criticism if I had like a real if i had a real like someone knew me for something like no one knows yeah. me for anything and not knowing that but like, that's what right I'm doing right now is i'm really just trying to get like um learn enough that i am able to be uh, usable by other people and i really think that's how you make money what do you mean by in that this industry yeah what do you mean to be by that? help like um the last project i helped someone with i helped her develop the songs and stuff like that from the get-go like i played with the piano and she came up with ideas and lyrics and i just kind of work with it and try to catch the things i thought were catchy and try to like uh, work on just structure mm -hmm. and then after that we finally had a friend come out and help produce it well, he produced it, but um, we were all in the thing, and you know, uh, seeing it go from the kind of pieces that we put together to then the structure that he was putting together, and then putting these pieces kind of, you know, it just I learned so much about the way everything's put together. What was the topic of the thing in the first place? Oh, there's no topic, baby. We just keep going. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it was yeah, just yeah, about yeah. the different components with which, um, you know, what you're outsourcing yeah, useful, versus right? what you're doing. But that's what I'm useful for. I'm useful because, like, I hear I'm able to work with someone and I make sense of what they're hearing and what they want. And I'm also able to guide them in direction, which is everyone, everyone, like every musician does that with everybody that's listening, you know? Yeah. So, like, being there for somebody is, I think, the only way that I'm ever, you know, I want to. I want to work with other people and I want to make their music too. It's not just my, you know, my thing. You want everybody which, to eat. Yeah. I want everyone to eat. Yeah. That's I good. Think that's how I'm going to be able to eat. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, I want to have that communal kind of, uh, necessity. No, that's good. That's a good way to, to build. So how, how do you meet them? Are they just already your friends or are you like, is there such thing as like musicians networking in the yeah, East right. side? <laughs> yeah i know tech um, bros do that i don't know if musicians do that too they do do that i think so I, i'm right now it's just been friends um people have just kind of popped in and, and stayed for a little bit you know uh but that's definitely the thing that i am really focused on right not really focused on but i'm aware of right now is that that's the next part of my evolution is i need to start looking for people and working with more people i don't know so that's one of those things that like that's kind of also a hard part it's like pushing and especially right now you don't really meet anybody you know well your whole on your working that's right i i hope through this maybe serendipitously we'll find some yeah. musician who's listening to this and you'll you'll link up and they'll throw some ethiopian vibes into your next music project oh i would love that <laughs> <laughs> i could cut no. up this interview and put this into a Put it oh, in your real? Or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go for it, man. Go for it. That would be dope. That would be dope. To to a anything to to do um, to connect everybody and have that communal eating, like you're talking about. So, does that include songwriting as well? Like, are you doing your own songwriting? Are you helping others with songwriting as well? Um, the only person I'm helping songwriting with. No, I think I'm. I'm basically done working with her since I finished her pro finished the project with her, but. Um, she's basically the pr other producer, the producer friend of mine that I was talking about and her, the two people that I've basically been songwriting with, but I've been doing songwriting on my own as well. So that's one of those 
it's nice to work with other people and do it on your own and develop it that way. But what and what what type of yeah. story are you trying to tell through your music? If it's hush hush, you could let me know. But in no, terms no, of no. ongoing stuff, um, I'm not trying to tell one story or the other. I'm really trying to kind of, as like a songwriter, I really am trying to figure out how to sit down and work every day and be consistent and I write like that. Yeah. Right. And just like kind of sitting down and working and figuring out why it's working and why it's not working and just kind of having that underneath my belt all the time that I'm always doing. Um, so that's a constant thing that I'm doing songwriting wise, but uh, working, I don't really have, On the projects that I'm working on right now, I wouldn't say I even have one like message necessarily, you know? I, yeah, I'm you not don't really need, you don't need to have a meta narrative. Like yeah. in hip hop, you know, it's what I know best probably. The mm -hmm. the big kind of difference I mean, and again, it's, it's way more than that, but the, the big difference between most MCs and sometimes people call it MC versus rapper, but it's like someone who has a me a meta narrative like a Rakim or a Nas or somebody yeah. like Fabulous or Lil Wayne who are called punchline rappers who all they're worried about is like the immediate metric. Does A B go with yeah. A B? You know, that exactly. That's, you know what I mean? Okay, so that's that's really what I'm like hearing right now is like the same way that the, the rapper's putting A and B together. I'm really hearing that like I'm putting together structures that are based upon rhymes. Sometimes I'm slurring the rhyme because to me, it's hearing the melody is the most important thing. Yeah. And then hearing the vowel and hearing the way that they kind of connect everything together. So you can have almost an entire song of gibberish, but it may be the catchiest thing in the world because you're putting it together around the catchiness. You know, you're, you're constructing. Absolutely. It yeah. And, and people could misinterpret that, right? Like a lot of people got in trouble when they didn't realize the code switching of Rihanna. Right. They didn't realize or they mm. must have forgot that she's from Barbados and what they perceived yeah. to be gibberish was an intelligent dialect of English as it was spoken in the Caribbean, which, yeah. you know, it, it reminds me of a phenomenon that I've seen several times, especially when I was I was a Lyft driver for a couple of years. I got to hear a yeah. lot of different stories of folks from the South and the Midwest. And one of the most common things that I would hear them telling me is that when they moved out here because it was such a low hanging fruit people would mm -hmm. be poking at their accent they learned how to suppress it but then they would say like when they get inebriated and stuff that it would come out but also if certain people try to pigeonhole them for a role they knew yeah. how to bring it out and they didn't want to stay in that role but if they needed to make some quick cash you know yeah turning it up a little that they could they could do that i'm wondering when i hear you saying that um mm -hmm. are you ever bringing in the the kentucky yeah. accent kentucky. into the singing or no um uh, yeah, I can't help it. It's one of those things like, if, especially when if I'm, I'm just being, uh, being playful, especially when I'm not trying, like I'm just kind of, it's one of my go-to like voices. It's not really my voice per se, but it's like one of those things like I hear, like I hear the, the, the Kentucky, I hear the slurs and the, the kind of country kind of feel. So well, like, that's funny to me because I don't hear even a tinge. I really don't even hear only, a tinge in you. It's when I sing, man. It's, it's yeah. the only time it really happened. And it's not even when I sing all the times. It's just like one of those things I hear, I, I, I kind of go to, it's like a go to, it's not even on purpose. It's not like yeah. a thing. I was going to say just, it might be certain nice words. Sometimes. I was going to guess it might be yes, certain words. You remember when I first, the, I remember that in Pepperdine, you were going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes. <laughs> 10. Yes. 10 versus 10. 10. Yeah. yeah. You know why it's funny? It's because, um, and the, there's a, I'm interested in linguistics, right? And I, I've recently read a book, Talking Back, Talking Black, by a black mm -hmm. linguist from uh, New York called John McWhorter. And he talked about this phenomenon that some people recognize, some people don't. It's like a lot of black folks are from the South. And yeah. so the white Southern accent and the black English, like there's a lot of crossover. It's not exactly mm -hmm. the same, but there are a lot of things that come yeah. over and that's because of like a shared history of mm -hmm. you know living in 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 closer proximity to each other so what what was so interesting to me is i didn't i didn't know that many non-black folk from the south so when i met you one of the things was it was almost like almost like the similarities with like black english you know and i couldn't yeah. necessarily put a finger on it but like there's there's humor there to be found you know for some people in the west coast who are not hip you know who are like ignorant to to that yeah 
Totally. It's the same thing with the Minnesota accent. When that comes up, I'm always just like, okay. Oh, it's hilarious. Oh, yeah. yeah I, so I was in Minnesota a lot, when I, especially when I lived in North Dakota. So it yeah. would come up, you know, instead of creek, it's creek. You go by down to creek. the creek. Uh, you say yeah. a boot like like Canadians. It's very similar. I feel like the Canadian accent, and it makes sense because like most Canadians are near the, like within a mile or so of the, the border, or I don't know what the exact mm -hmm. figure, but they're all close to the border pretty much. Yeah. So, yeah, that sort of uh, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin – michigan that that sort of midwest <laughs> accent mm -hmm. it again it doesn't come up on every word it's certain no, things no, no, no. Wh yeah. wh where I'm did you encounter it come out what'd you say um i worked in a, i worked in a clay mine for uh, -huh. uh summer for um right outside of kentucky uh right outside of paducah kentucky quill city usa um, shout out. and then yeah shout out uh someone told me a story recently about them traveling from florida to denver colorado and they stopped off halfway between what literally they were told was halfway between and they go you know where i stopped off paducah kentucky <laughs> <laughs> and they go i looked around and i go nobody lives here <laughs> dude you got to do a concert there you got to do a concert i would love i would love to do that i would love to do that that'd be a real throwback oh my god that'd be awesome uh that'd be really cool i would love have a giant that. quilt that says zach yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> zach's um back <laughs> <laughs> Zach's back. There you go. It's even rhyming. There yeah. you are. Um, so, uh, do you, do you have a, a stage name or a pseudonym, or do you go by your real name? Or um, I don't. I mean, I I've, I don't really like the way that my Zachary Taylor doesn't really sound like any. It doesn't really say anything. You know what I mean? It just sounds like someone's name, which is not a bad thing. That's probably you know, it's a decent thing to have a name. Uh, but I thought about other things, and I had. To, Tom Sawyer as my like SoundCloud, but then I thought about after and Tom spelled like T H O M, and then okay. Sawyer spelled funny too. Yeah, I, I thought I was being clever, but then like in retrospect, I was like thinking about it recently with everything going on, and I was thinking about the characters in Tom Sawyer and like which one <laughs> that Tom Sawyer actually was and what he actually represented in the story, and I was just like, okay, yeah, uh, uh, N word like, Jim or Engine Joe, yeah, yeah, <laughs> or like if you're gonna be someone be be huckleberry finn you know if we're gonna be one of the characters from that book because he's at least yeah. he's not the racist one tom's like inadvertently racist and like <laughs> it's <laughs> you know of... it's it's very interesting there's a i don't know if you've seen it on ig a black pepperdine ig account where there's a phenomenon at several universities where people are airing out grievances from the administration, from staff, from faculty, but then also from students and their experiences. Yeah. And some of them are frivolous. Some yeah. of them are very, very legit and like scary. And you're like, wow, at that school? Really? Yeah, because, you know, you'd be surprised. Um, and and that, they brought that book up, actually. Someone yeah. brought that book up. And it's like in an academic context with the trigger warning, should you be able mm -hmm. to say some things or, you know, are, are some things incantations that just, you know, cannot be pronounced? I, I tend to, even though I wince at hearing things like that, I tend to lean on the in an academic space with mm -hmm. a proper advanced warning or trigger that we should consult the text as they are because it's almost like pretending that the history didn't happen or, yeah. you know, trying to, trying to have some sort of erasure. And I think that there's some part of that pain at the same time. It's legitimate. If, if people don't want to be subject to that, like, you know, they should be allowed to, to exit without being like penalized um, grade wise. But yeah, that's, that's an interesting point you you bring up i didn't even think about it when you said it but as soon as you yeah. explained that i remember that that page and and people who have those um those grievances yeah what were the grievances in particular is that they utilizing some, so like that they... a non-black professor would mm -hmm. say the the slurs oh why would he have a need to though like why would he need if to they're say it? if they're reading the, it's text, in the book right oh. yeah if they're reading the text so you read the book at home but then you go mm -hmm. over certain portions in like a comparative literature course or something yeah. like that. So, you know, the options are you either, you know, like I did, you either say like N word or something or you pause 
and just yeah. ba- bathe in the silence, which is what one of the commenters said. They, they <laughs> said, like, p- just pause, be silent during that part and bathe yeah. in the silence. Or you, or you say it. Um, and, and again, there's the version where you give a warning and there's also a version where you don't give any warning. You just kind of go into it as if it's normal. So those yeah. are all like different things that somebody could do in that environment. Another option, of course, is to take the book off of the, the canon of literature yeah. that you're examining. There's plenty of really good books out there. I don't see the issue of removing a book. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, and, and, I agree. You know. Reading like these books before like, there were books to be read. You know, before I realized that there were books to be read, and like it wasn't like a thing that like I don't hold any of these books precious. Like the, I feel like the all those authors are held precious. You know, and it's just like it's a history. They're that canonized. We're making. They're, canonized yeah, they're canonized. Like saints. Yeah. 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 Totally. Totally. And like the things to look up for, but you read those kind of the dialogue in this on that time. You're like, it's just like movies. You're like, Oh, this is so dated. I don't get it. You know, <laughs> it's like good reading. Talk about long winded. <laughs> yeah. Keep it nice and short for our generation. So yeah. do, do you have a method by which you find new books? Like, do you, do you have certain people that recommend you books or do you just uh, trust the almighty algorithm? On Amazon, the or... algorithm on Amazon, all times. Um, I haven't been, uh, I haven't been reading honestly in the past like few years, but uh, I've been finding most of the stuff just um, books I've heard in the zeitgeist of things I've you know wanted to read and stuff like that. And since I have been reading such a long time, I kind of have a a few books on the shelf that I I've been waiting to get to. Oh, okay. There we yeah. go. There we yeah. go. This is the encouragement. But I mean, you've been writing, so. What's yeah, totally. what's interesting is the the play between being a consumer mm-hmm. of something and then being like a producer of something. Totally. I've, I I think over abused the consuming end. <laughs> I just wanted to like read and listen to everything for years, and I would I would make things, you know, I would produce mm-hmm. things from from time to time, but only now I think am I tilting the balance and i almost feel guilty sometimes where i'm like my stack of books will get up and i am a reader yeah. but i i read very slowly i retain what i read but i read yeah. very slowly it might take me two years or a year to get through a certain book or something you know i'll read a chapter and put it down and maybe holler what at kind it of books are you reading i feel like you're reading things that are a little more a little more dense than what i'm considering so right <laughs> i've got a bunch of funny things so yeah. I have Bronze Age Mindset by the Bronze Pervert. I have the <laughs> Screw Tape Letters by C.F. Okay. Lewis. Yeah, yeah. And I have the Origin of Amharic and Skin in the Game by uh, Nis- Nicholas N- Nassim Nicholas Taleb. So those are a few of the books on my desk. That's the issue is yeah. I don't just read one at once. Yeah, you're reading a few. I know that's the that's the kind of thing you pick up and you read a few pages, read a you read a chapter, couple chapters. I've been reading. Uh, uh, what is that book called? I don't remember what the book's called. That's how, how long it's been. I've been reading it. Uh, something, Gravity's Rainbow. I've been reading it for two years. Nice. <laughs> it's yeah. a, is it a novel or is it? Yeah, it's a novel. It's like 400. It's, it's a thick novel. So I've written, I've read like 300 pages of it, which is not yeah. very, it feels like halfway maybe. Um, Do you ever mess with audiobooks as a music person? I'll tell you, I, I really just got like through two. I really in the past few it. months, I got through two books because I did audio yeah. book versions. And there's, uh, I'm super into podcasts. You know, obviously a podcaster. Yeah. Dan Carlin's Hardcore History is a podcast, but really his his things are like mm. books. And I just finished like, what is it? Something crazy. Like, I finished this eight nine hour session on uh, World War Two, and yeah. I'm continuing like the next set of the series of that. But that's about equivalent, like. Eight seven eight hours is about an average, you know, hundred something page book. Yeah. So if you are able to sit down for that, like I don't know, it's weird. Like I, mean, I have I more patience to do that. I was driving left too, but basically about the same time you were, I think. And nice. I was listening to a lot of music, and I was listening to some podcasts too, and I was listening to books. And what would you play for your guests? I just go through and I make a I. It's a little, I mean, I'm a little embarrassed because it's a little bit dangerous, but I was making uh, uh, playlists on the fly for them. 
Oh, okay. Like, depending on the on the songs they were starting to like and uh, while they're sitting in the car. But I play a lot of um, stuff I liked. Yeah, just kind of Dude. experimental, electronic, and. Uh, that points to emotional disco. intelligence to me. It's like the chess. You're reading them and yeah. responding. You're re reading them and reacting them, trying to figure out what matches. I did it yeah. on a much smaller scale. I had pretty much three channels I would switch between, right? Yeah. Almost every time of day, best shot cutting across the most demographics, 91.5 classical music. Nice. The only, only demographic that doesn't work for Friday yeah. night, Saturday night. Yeah. <laughs> One dude, I'll give you a quick anecdote. One dude yeah. gets in the car. Oh, you're playing Johan? Matt's based. And I was like, uh, yeah, 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 Johannes Bach. And then it's like five minutes in. Oh, yeah, he's still playing Johan. Nice. And it's like 15 minutes in. Yo, dude, when are you going to stop playing Johan? And he flipped out on me. Like he really <laughs> flipped out on me. Like he was being super passive aggressive. And yeah. then he turned up at one point. And I was like, man, if you had just told me from the beginning, I would have known. And, you know, that's when I would put on like the hip hop or the, or the pop yeah. music. And then on the occasion that they're doing their, uh, their biannual drive for money at uh, KUSC, <laughs> the classical music, I would, I would bump the uh, like jazz or smooth jazz. That, that seemed to be the most neutral. But that's me yeah. just like making a compromise for everyone versus like mm -hmm. you're like tailoring it to people. Pun intended. Well, I mean, like you know, it's a it's a bit of exaggeration, I'm sure, but you know, because I'm I'm tailoring it to some extent, but I'm really starting with base of like the stuff that I'm exploring, and I'm, I'm kind of also backing off of the thing I'm exploring, and using the stuff that I think is more mainstream of what I'm exploring. That I can still kind of listen to things that I think are because listening to a lot of new music, mm -hmm. I didn't want to stop listening to new music, <laughs> so I didn't know what what I was about to listen to sometimes. Yeah, I go down like certain roads, and then then that would take me back to things that I liked. So I I go back and give them the things that I thought were connected to that song. Musically. And any any moments of friction between people not liking any music like selections? Like you were saying, there's there's a little bit of that from time to time where someone was just like, like I would I'd be a little turned up for their taste. Oh, you know? okay. Or so like, like not because I'm a pumping too hard, but it's just like it'd just be too frantic or it'd be too much information and they just need to like no Is it about them being old or no radio? In the morning? Old in the morning? Oh yeah. I'm sure or either sure of those things. I mean that, yeah, that's a double whammy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> older in the morning is a double whammy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just thinking in my head, what are things that would trigger that? And you know, I remember I had played like reggaeton or hip hop before in the morning yeah. and the people were like, Oh man, bro, I'm trying to go to work. Like I'm not yeah. ready. It definitely, I'm sure that happened. I can't remember a specific time, but I did, I mean, you drive so much and you pick up so many people that it's like hard to remember. I can remember people's, if I saw the person, I can remember their face. I still seen people to this day that I've take, given rides to and I know who they are. And then I like their, their ride flashes back to me. And I like, I remember wow. what we talked about in the ride. But like, I would have a tough time at that. Props to you. Uh, well, it's just because you have a lot of some interesting conversations. I was right when I was starting to think about being like doing music more than just piddling away with it, but trying to figure out how to produce it more and, and sound design more and kind of figure out because I just didn't know what else to do. I just figured I'd figure it out and stuff. I bumped into this guy and give him a ride who uh, does that or produces music for like a TV show or something like that. And he has, you know, he just kind of implanted ideas of like what's kind of expected of producers. I didn't really have a lot of friends who were even producers at the time. Yeah. So like, um, yeah, I just like got that kind of plugged in my head and I knew his friend uh, sells, buys pianos and sells pianos. So like I saw him at a party like a year ago, two years ago. And I didn't, I was, I didn't bring it up to him because I was like in and out about to leave. Yeah. But I just had that entire like you know, Ryan come back where I was like, Oh, his old roommate sells pianos and he's a producer and he works for this TV show and this kind of thing. That, and I was like, oh, okay. So it's like things that are like, I remember things that are pertinent to like my, what I would consider my evolution at the time, you know? And kind that's of, good. Cause you never, mm -hmm. you never know when that, that chance is going to be. You just have to keep that consistency that you mentioned earlier. And, <laughs> hope that at one moment you know you're gonna pop like 
one of these things will pop, you know. Sometimes I make ridiculous videos. I made I made one, you know, the other day reading a very mundane like historical document that I translated oh, yeah. from Amharic to English and freaking got like <laughs> it went like baby viral, you know, and I was like this is like I had no expectation of that happening. And it's yeah. just like, you know, it's not necessarily the thing that you know, other there are other things, for example, that I probably would have held in higher esteem that did not right. <laughs> that did not have the same thing. But you know, you never know what is gonna trigger at the right moment for people and spread. So that that's why I'm I yeah. keep doing this, man. This 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 has been dope, man. So tell hit hit up people up with your SoundCloud, man. Let them know your SoundCloud so that they can uh, holler at it. Okay, um, I think it's on Zachary Taylor. At this point, I think I changed it back. Or maybe it's still under Tom Sawyer and I forgot to change it. But I think it's Zachary Taylor. Um, you can check me out on Spotify as LeCat. Uh, Spell group that for it. L-E-C-A-T. Uh, so it's a misspelling of the French word. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fun project. We have two songs out right now. And we'll have the rest of the album out by the... Hopefully the end. Hopefully. End of the month, beginning of the next month. You know how it goes. You get you get going. You gotta start adding. Yeah, stuff. I was like, like today's oh, the no, 29th. You better watch out. You better yeah, watch yeah, out. Yeah. Beginning of the month. Yeah, it's supposed to be already out, but you know, soon, coming soon. Yes, coming we'll keep soon. it safe. Coming soon, and more to come. Yes, Definitely. before Dr. Dre's next album. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hard, hard, hard out. <laughs> No, that's good. So, uh, and then uh, you could plug, is there anywhere else online? So Spotify, SoundCloud, anything anywhere else you want them yeah, to? Yeah, check out on, oh no, there's nothing other than that. Those two, good. Spotify and SoundCloud. I didn't know if you were on YouTube or anything. I am I do have stuff on YouTube, but it's like for my mom to watch and oh, okay. not for you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. No, no, it's for like videos from like years ago that I have. Unlisted. Yeah, unlisted. We'll yeah. keep it unlisted. <laughs> it's really hard to find for a broad purpose. No worries. No worries. Thank you. Of course, man. Thank you. This is